So if you're anything like me, when you turn on the radio or you turn on a show and there's an actor on there and you're listening and it's somebody who has spoken about the right to abortion or they donate to Planned Parenthood or they tout these views that you totally and massively disagree with, I have a hard time listening to them and enjoying them. I have a hard time checking out and saying, okay, just, you know, whatever, you can put your views aside for just a minute, deal with it. No, I don't like it. I don't enjoy them. I usually turn it off. Um, maybe that's extreme, maybe it's not, but it makes me wonder where are the artists who are vocal about the their biblical values? Where are the artists who are vocal about the right to life? Where are the artists who are pro-America? I mean, my goodness, why can't they speak out? Why aren't they speaking out? But today's guest does. I found them. I found one. There's one for sure. Maybe there's more, but I found one. <laughs> um, today we have on John Cooper, who is the lead singer. He's a bassist, songwriter, and producer for the band Skillet. You've probably heard of them. They are one of the best-selling rock bands of the 21st century, which is phenomenal. Um, and I'm really excited to have him on and for you guys to hear from him. He also is the podcast host of Cooper Stuff, where he is probably the most bold. So I suggest you check it out there. He's got a great, great podcast. Um, and he's the author of a new book called Wimpy, Weak, and Woke. And I can just tell you by the name of the title, it's gonna be something that you love. Um, but aside from the title, the book is actually phenomenal. Uh, the back of the book, I'm gonna read you a little excerpt. It says, the increasing conflicts in America today are often referred to as culture war. But what is truly happening is a war between gods, the living God and the God of man. Wimpy, Weak, and Woke uncovers the philosophies behind utopian dreams that become dystopian nightmares and presents a positive vision of how we can thrive and flourish. The false promises of man lead to destruction. God's ways lead to, li lead to life. John uncovers the prevailing lies that are destroying America and shows how the truth of the Bible can save us. So we're talking about his book today. You can tell just from that excerpt, it is amazing. I want you guys to get it, check it out, read it. Um, you should be reading tons of books. It's so good for you. And we also talk about the music industry as a whole and how the music industry treats him. We talk about the right to life. We're talking about public school in the state of education. Is public school even a feasible option anymore? We're going into all of it and more, and I think you guys are gonna love this one. John, thank you so much for joining the podcast today. You are in one of the best-selling rock bands of all time, or the, the 21st century. You're a two-time Grammy Award nominated, 17-time platinum. You were inducted into Pandora's Billionaire Club after garnering two billion streams, which is like hard to think about for me. Your Billboard Music Award winner, GMA Dev Awards, and more. It seems you know the music industry well, but... Your mom used to say that rock music was of the devil. <laughs> How did you get here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true, actually. Yeah. So I grew up in a very, um, uh, a very kind of strict religious atmosphere. My mom was, was a Jesus fanatic, uh, and I mean that in a good way. She, she was just a yeah. Jesus freak, and, uh, and I loved it. It was a great way to grow up. My mom taught me about the Bible taught me about the Lord. We pray together, all that kind of stuff. And uh, it was an amazing way, way to grow up. Yeah, the one, I guess, I don't think, it, I don't want to say downside, but the one downside, if that's the right word, man, she hated rock music. She, she really believed that <laughs> anything with drums or guitars was just from the hmm. devil. I mean, it, it was like like Satan created this kind of music. That is the way that Satan is going to take over the world even more through rock music. And so uh, she, she really hated rock music. And then when I discovered Christian rock music, it's because I was complaining um, at, with, at, at church with one of my buddies. I was, he, he was like, you got to hear this, dude. This is, this is called Metallica. It's called metal, you know? And uh, I remember yeah. hearing it and I was just like, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. It's the best thing I've ever heard, hands down. And I was complaining. There's no way my parents would let me bring this home. And uh, he said, well, you know there's Christian rock music. And I said, no, I didn't know this. And so he, he gave me a, <laughs> a tape from a Christian rock band called Petra. And so I brought uh, Petra home thinking that um, my mom did not know what Christian music was. As it turns out, she did know what Christian music was. And Christian <laughs> music was the only thing the devil ever created that was worse than rock music because it was wolves in sheep's clothing. And so my mom was so upset with me listening with Christian rock music. So it's kind of a funny story now. You know, that, that's kind of how I grew up. And uh, so whenever I meet people that say, there's no way you guys could be Christian. Look at your music or the way you look at this. 
I never really get mad at those people. I've always had a lot of grace for them. I'm always like, oh, I get, I understand where they're coming from. My mom was the same way. I love that story because my mom was kind of the same. Um, she'd go through my albums and she'd toss things out or she'd see what CDs I had, uh, which kids today don't even know pretty much what a CD is or use CDs anymore. It's all <laughs> streaming music. Um, so you're one of the few in the music industry and even Christian music world, which is kind of sad, that has spoken out on the issue of life, especially after Roe. Why do you think that is? Yeah, it's interesting. Um I don't have a good answer for this, and, and I've been asked a lot, and the truth is I just don't know because I want to be honest, but I want to be gracious at the same time. The truth is I just don't know. I will say this. There always seemed to be an unspoken kind of rule. Uh, I, 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 nobody ever said it, but Christian musicians have never – I shouldn't say never, rarely – gotten really vocal about what I would say anything political or anything that is maybe ext like a, a a moral issue that is a really like volatile thing. It just was sort of looked at as something we don't do. And I think uh -huh. that maybe some of the reason I, I think it is in, in, in his best spin. And I think this is true. Uh, and the reason I say this is because I did it for for years and year, for decades. I didn't either. And the reason for me was because I was I was quite naive, but we were living in a different time. And that different time period had a presupposition that everyone understood what Christians believed about ethics. Um, and if anybody's watching and don't know what ethics means, it just means morals, okay? It means moral <laughs> policy, moral ideas. We kind of thought everybody knew that, so there was no reason to harp on the pro-life issue, because whenever I say I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian band, I want to sing songs about Jesus and how Jesus can change your life, the presupposition was Jesus changes your life and you begin to change the way you act because you want to live like a Christian. And when you live like right. a Christian, that means that you say no to premarital sex or extramarital sex or pornography or abortion or fill in the blank. And so it was just a presupposition, and I thought we all kind of knew that. And so for me, when it began to change was in the – to 2013, 2014, I began to see a lot of Christian musicians becoming very vocal about ethics and po politics. And I remember thinking, that's not something Christian musicians do. But the, the, the crazy thing was that they were, all, they were all on the opposite side of what I believe. In other words, they weren't speaking out for uh, traditional biblical morality in the way I understood it or, or conservative ideas. They were speaking out for progressive ideas. And they were all of a sudden really like promoting progressive people. That means they, they were they were they were promoting people who vote for abortion, who are pro choice. And my mind was blown. I was just like, I do not understand this. So I think there's a lot of things going on. And now you you're ten years later, when I got loud about it was because I realized, oh People don't no longer hold a presupposition that to be a Christian means that you stand up for life, that you vote for life, that you are against abortion. Uh, that's no longer a presupposition. And so I started seeing people saying the opposite. And I was like, oh, not today, Satan. And so I just said, <laughs> we got to get loud about this. Being yeah. a Christian means following the ways of Jesus and loving the moral law of God. And so when I started getting loud about it, I mean— the vitriol that came against me, and I'm, I'm not saying woe is me, I'm, I, I did it, and, and I, sure, I'm sure. glad. The vitriol from Christians against me made me realize, oh my gosh, I should have been loud about this a decade ago. I had no idea. Right. Completely naive. So we've got to get loud about these kind of things because there's a new movement happening in Christianity that is very kind of – um, I, 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 you could call it deconstruction. You could call it deconversion. You could call it, pro, uh, quote, progressive Christianity, it's sometimes called. And that new movement is one that wants to separate Jesus from the, the morality of the Bible. So it's almost like separating this, a concept of who Jesus was, but separating it from the Bible as if you can kind of create this bifurcation. And yeah. that's something that you can't do. That's an impossibility. If you do that, then you are now worshiping a new false Jesus. And that's why I decided I got to get loud about it. Yeah. Well, we're so glad that you did. And I've been through your podcast. I've listened to several of the episodes and you're very bold with what you talk about. And there are 
people in the Christian music industry who are, um, I guess, promoting the opposite. Like you said, um, Lecrae is one of them. And I, it, it's really sad to see, and I hope and pray that these people kind of wake up and, um, you had a lot of names for it, but I'd also say wimpy, weak and woke, no pun intended, <laughs> um, when it comes to that, but we'll get into that a little bit later within the Christian music world. Are you getting pushback from people for being pro-life? Like uh, we're talking label and mm. all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I am. I mean, uh, I, again, I want to make sure that nobody ever hears me say, woe is me. I'm under fire. People are being so mean yeah. to me. Oh, come on now. You know, you, that uh, that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I do think that oh. there's a certain amount of, of disillusionment, though. And, um, it's it's not hurtful in a, oh, it hurts my feelings. It's It makes you sad because you realize that even a lot of Christians are really just blinded to ethics. They're blinded to morality, and it makes you sad for the church. And so I am receiving a, a a lot of people going, "Thank you so much, John, for standing for this. You're you're helping me want to also stand up for life or stand up for X, Y, or Z." And then there are other people that are saying, "John, it's not that I disagree with you, but I don't want to be associated with you. You're too. You're too. You're too." edgy or it's too loud or it's it doesn't seem quote loving enough or this or the other the thing that's happening um and i want to be really fair the thing that's happening with some artists uh i think you mentioned lecrae i don't i don't think i'm off base for saying this uh, i don't want to make sure people understand i'm not attacking him you can go watch my podcast i, I quote lecrae i have his own his stuff there lecrae is a christian not saying he's not a christian we're friends um the thing that people like Lecrae and I would say the and campaign. Have you covered the and campaign on your show? I've seen it a little bit. Uh, I haven't gone deep into it, but I know I know what you're talking okay. about. For people who are interested in the issue of life and where the church is at on this issue, which I'm assuming is a lot of the people watching the show, <laughs> you really need yeah. to understand what the and campaign is. The end campaign was supported by people like Tim Keller, uh, the late Tim Keller. He he passed away a couple of years ago. I'd say Tim Keller is the most influential Christian philosopher of the last two decades, uh, two and a half mm -hmm. decades in America. And uh, Tim Keller was very supportive of end campaign. It's also – there's a lot of people that support this. People like Lecrae and other Christian artists also support the end campaign. The end campaign is very sly. Now, here's what they do. They say, hey, yeah. we need to get involved in politics with a Christian worldview, but we're not progressive and we're not conservative. We're biblical. Now, that's what they say. That gets a lot of amens mm. from a lot of Christians because a lot of us say, well, sure. I don't want to be labeled with the GOP or the DNC. I want to be a, a follower of Jesus. A lot of people go, well, I get that, you know. But what they do then is that they equate the killing of the unborn, which are, uh, to be fair to Ann campaign, they will say that is unjust. So they do say it's unjust, but it is equated with the what they would call injustice of not paying for women's health care and child care and some sort of universal income and reparations for slavery and um, paying for people's college debt. You know, the very progressive things. So they would say, yeah. of course, the killing of the unborn is unjust. But you can't fix that with conservative policies. You can't fix that with law. You need to fix that by taking care of everything that someone is going to need so that they stop having abortions. That's where a lot of these, what I would call more progressive-leaning Christian artists, are landing on. Here's the reason it's so very dangerous is because they are equating one thing that is a clear-cut breaking of the moral law of God. You can't murder yeah. You can't do it, and you can't make excuses for it. They're equating that with what they believe is an injustice. I would argue that it is not an injustice that we do not pay for everyone's child care in America. That's, that's moving towards socialism. That is a political philosophy of collectivism of some sort, whether it's socialism, communism, or, or just some sort of Marxist progressive worldview. Now, as a Christian, is it possible to believe 
that that would be a good thing to do. Sure. I, I don't think the law of God, uh, you know, accounts for that. I believe that that's stealing. You go to one person and you say, you make too much money. I'm taking your money and I'm giving it to someone else so that they can go and do whatever they want to and have sex with whoever they want to without any repercussions. If they get pregnant, we're going to make somebody that has more money pay for it. I think that's breaking the law of God, but I do know Christians that follow that. This upsets me because it's such cloudy moral thinking, and it's really absurd. The law of God, when I say the law of God, I'm talking about the Ten Commandments and then all the the, the various laws we have throughout the Old Testament, okay? We have an understanding of what is worse. For instance, if you go and kill somebody under the Old Testament law, you have thou shalt not murder, and God instituted an eye for an eye in the Old Testament, right? Because it's a really terrible thing to murder somebody. If you steal from somebody, God did not say go and cut their hands off as a punishment or go and kill them as a punishment. God instituted restitution. That's how we know which sins and which crimes are worse than other crimes. We don't have to guess. So we're not going to start instituting a thing saying, hey, you stole money from somebody and that's just as bad as killing somebody. We know better than that because God gave us the punishments for the crimes and for breaking the moral law of God. And so for us as Christians to say that we are, we're not progressive and we're not conservative, we're going to equate mm-hmm. not giving child care to murdering the actual only innocent human beings on the planet because they're not, they're not born yet. Like they haven't actually committed a sin yet. It's absolutely mind boggling to see these Christian artists do it, but they are doing it because of that's the way they've been taught from some very sneaky um, Christian outlets like the Ann campaign. And I don't want to beat up mm-hmm. on Pastor Tim Keller again. He, he died a few years ago. I don't want to tarnish his legacy. Did a, he did a bunch of great things for the kingdom. But his view on morality and ethics was driven, in my view, from a very progressive, uh, pseudo-Marxist view. I would say neo-Marxist view of the world. And it just muddied up his, his thinking on morality, in my humble opinion. Yeah, it's interesting because if, when you have that, you have uh, people saying they don't want to be labeled Republican or Democrat or you know left or right or this or that. They just want to be biblical. But then they say things that are completely aligned with one side of the political aisle when to me... It's not the government's responsibility to pay for these things. There are people who are going to be in need. And a lot of times you go to your family, you ask for help. If the the family, if it's too big for the family, maybe the church can step in and help. And then there's community. Like it shouldn't have to fall on the government or on taxpayer citizens, but also what about just responsibility? What about just not having sex before you're married? What about not sleeping around or sleeping with a bunch of different women or sleeping with a bunch of different guys? I mean, at what point do we say like, Hey, Let's bring things back. We don't have to have all these solutions for all this other stuff because there's this. We can just be abstinent. We don't have to have sex. And people think, oh, you're crazy. People are just going to do it. I know people who are in their 20s or who have, um, I had a child out of wedlock myself and unplanned pregnancy was why I'm so passionate about the pro-life movement. But um, I know people who are in their 20s or in their 30s who waited to have sex till marriage. Like it is possible. Yeah. And if we put the emphasis back on Christian ethics and morals and values, we could potentially get there. That a hundred percent. I agree with you so much. Number one, um, this idea that you should be able to have, I hate, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm getting too philosophical for listeners. I hope that I'm not. It's just the way my brain thinks. No, bring it on. This idea that sex is a, uh, it's not just sex. It's, it's, it's free sex is a human right. Like that sort of idea. Like it is your human, almost yeah. like an inalienable right or something like that, that you deserve right. like and you have the right it. to have sex at any point, any way you want it and should not have to have to deal with the consequences of it. That is a new idea in Western civilization. That's not like going back hundreds and hundreds of years. It was obvious that you're going to have to deal with the consequences of this thing. That is something yeah. that happened with Freud and, and then the neo-Marxists and the liberationist movements, the feminism, second wave feminism, the pill. All of these sayings are geared towards this idea that you cannot be a truly free human being 
well, actually, namely a woman. You can't be a, a, a truly few, a free woman unless you can have sex without any consequences of it. It's absolutely miraculous. And I, in, in 2021 is when I started going, okay, I say these things about the pro-life stuff that, that I thought that I had read, I thought I understood. I'm getting all this pushback from Christians who are mad at me that say I'm lying and I'm spreading propaganda. So I started digging into more research. And in 2021, again, I'm assuming this is for every year. I don't know that to be a fact. I only look for 2021. I was, I'm blown away to find out that the majority of women who have had abortions in 2021 already had one living child. So th- these are not people that don't understand how sex works. These are not people that are like, I didn't even, I didn't even know what was happening. And it is not yeah. majority teenagers like people keep saying. These are, these are teenagers who were raped, and this, that's not actually the majority of, of what is happening. I, I was blown away with the statistics from, from 2021. And so that's the second thing. The third thing is this. If people really need help, there are – Crisis pregnancy centers, church-run pregnancy centers, Christian, right. Catholic one, everywhere, and they are willing to raise money. They're willing to help. They're willing to give diapers. They're, I mean, my friend runs mm-hmm. one in town, and I go and I see the work they're doing. I'm, my mind is blown. There are so many people doing so much incredible work. If there's any propaganda, it's actually happening in the reverse because the more I read about the literature – the more I just found out this whole thing is just a big lie. All that is going on is that people have been told you have the right to have sex anytime with anybody you want to, and it should not be up to you to have to deal with the consequences. You're completely right. And pro-life uh, pregnancy resource centers do so much phenomenal work. I mean, they will walk with a woman a lot of times as long as she needs it. They're there for her. I, I have an organization I founded called Be Their Village. We do the same. We do baby showers for women. And they fill within like 45 minutes. If I post a baby registry, people are like, let's buy it up. The people will give the shirt off of their back, their last dollar in their bank account to these people because they want to love and support them. Um, and they're demonized a lot of times. I'm sure your friend knows that, you know, they're called a fake clinic or oh, yeah. they, they're just trying to manipulate women into having the baby and then they forget her afterward. I would assume you've walked in there. Or you mm-hmm. kind of know what they're doing. Do you see the lies that they're pushing? Mm. Oh, gosh, it's unbelievable. Um, it, it, there's so much propaganda happening in the opposite direction than we're, than we're told that it is. And I think yeah. that's what's so – and the truth is is that – a lot of the Christian um, – one of my pet peeves is, is – uh, I call it Big Eva, and sometimes when people say Big Eva, it stands for Big Evangelicalism. It's sort of like how people say mm. Big Business or Big Tech. Right. They call it Big Eva. But what we really mean is like the, these institutional um, – platform people. It's going to be Christian leaders that, that we look to who write op-eds in the New York Times. All right. It's going to be people who write, they, they write for these outlets. They go on the big podcast. They'll have them on in CNN. Okay. They'll have those. In other words, they're not going to have Franklin Graham come on MSNBC and give the pro-life position. They don't want to know Franklin Graham's version of that. They want to <laughs> find a big Eva leader who is yeah watered down, you know what I mean, and and who is basically going to bash on pro-lifers um, in some kind of a way. Even if they say they are pro, they'll say, well, look, I, I, I do believe in the right to life, but the problem is, is those Trump voters, that's who they want coming on MSNBC, right? So these yeah. big e- Eva writers, they are constantly bashing people like you, your clinic, my friend that runs the clinic here. They say they're pro-life, but they constantly bash on us. They call us, you know, the a MAGA or they call us things that aren't really even I mean it's like I really care, but they're not really true. We are not fighting for life because we are MAGA. It's just, it's just so ridiculous. Yeah. And so they're really spreading incredible propaganda and these Christian institutional leaders have swallowed the lies of the world to the degree that when Roe got overturned they wouldn't even celebrate. I, my mind was blown. These are people that have yeah. been, so, quote, unquote, yeah. fighting for the pro-life cause for 30 years. And they're like, hey, this is, uh, um, 
there's an outlet called the Gospel Coalition. Um, and now I feel like I keep beating up on Tim Keller the whole time, but um, <laughs> Pastor Tim Keller also started the Gospel Coalition. The Gospel Coalition, if you go online, they call it TGC.com, is a, a sort of outlet for pastors. So it's basically if you're a pastor and you're wanting to read what uh, what institutional leaders like Tim Keller and all these all these smart theologians, what are they writing for pastors to say, how do I deal with my um, LGBT child or for the pro-life movement or whatever it may be? You go to the Gospel Coalition and they're going to they're going to give you instruction. Well, the these organizations, uh, the TGC actually wrote an article. I quoted it in my book. After Roe was overturned and said, this is not a time for, quote unquote, Christian victory laps. This is not a time to be acting like you won this big victory as if you just won a football game or something like that. And I just, I couldn't believe it. People have been praying, seeking God, putting their money in, raising their voices, voting, asking God to overturn this unjust law for 50 years years. And you're going to tell us it's not a time for a victory lap? I wonder, and, and, and I said on my podcast, I wonder if those same evangelical leaders would have said that if it was, if we go back 150 years with the Emancipation Pro- Proclamation, how many of these people you'd be saying, hey, this is no time for a victory lap for the end of slavery. There are some people that are going to be scared. There's some people that aren't going to be happy. There's some people that can't pay their bills now because all their slaves are set free. This isn't a time for the victory lap. Shut up. You know that they wouldn't dare do something like that. So why are they doing it now? It's because they are compromised and they actually don't believe in the pro-life movement as they ought or as they claim they did. Preach it. Come on now. Um, (laughs) So shifting gears here slightly, but it touches on what we were talking about earlier, how you're saying there's this like the sexual liberation and people think they can just, they're entitled to sex, essentially. Demi Lovato, you've got thoughts on her song Swine. Share it with us. Yeah, it's just so disgusting. You know, I mean, here's the thing. I have lots and lots and lots of friends who are pro-choice. Actually, I have lots of friends who are pro-abortion, which I I realize that some people say, hey, if you're pro-choice, you are pro-abortion. I get it. But not all pro-choice people like abortion. You you know what I mean? So we may be talking about a worldview issue. But if you said, hey, do you think abortion is a really good thing? They wouldn't be like, oh, yeah, I love it. Well, there are some people that are like, oh, yeah, I actually love it. I think it is a positive good. It is justice. It's the thing I'm most passionate about in the whole world. I'm friends with some of those people. I'm a rock and roll musician. Most of my friends, Mm -hmm. most of the people I tour with on a constant day-to-day basis are not Christians. Duh. All right. So I love those people. They can vote that way if they want to. We enter into these conversations. But here's the deal, man. When somebody like Demi Lovato decides to write a song, it's her, what did she call it, her pro-choice anthem, or or it was her anti ro I, I can't remember what she called it, but basically, she released the song, Swine, one year on the anniversary of Roe going away, and it's her pro-abortion mm-hmm. song. And, and, and I, I'm not even, I really, I don't even feel good saying the lyrics, but go look it up, just Google the lyrics if you're of age. They're pretty repulsive. It is repulsive. The first two lines of the song allude to Basically, um, hey, I'm going to have sex with who I want to have sex with. I'm going to do oral sex with whoever I want to do oral sex with. And it's none of your business. I'm going to live my life. And then it goes straight from that into it's my body and my choice. And I guess what I said on my podcast was just like, this is the best argument for the pro-life position ever. This is what we've been saying. This actually is not about people not having money to raise kids and people needing money for childcare and this keeping people in poverty. It's not about that. This is about, I want to have sex with whoever I want to have sex with. She says it in her own song. It's so absolutely disgusting. And, uh, I just felt if you're going to have a song like that, that is just so, uh, I, I, I just, the idea that people are, you know, let me say it like this. Uh, P- Plato has a uh, has a famous saying that basically says a country cultivates what it honors. And I think a 
a, I think a 2020s version of that would say this. A country cultivates what it celebrates. That's how I would say it. Whatever we mm. celebrate, we're going to cultivate. And when you have pop artists, some of the, the most famous people in the world, celebrating the killing of human life, uh, we are under the judgment of God in such a way it needs to be rebuked. It needs a public rebuke. And for all the Christians out there saying, we, you should just reach out and love on them. Some things need a public rebuke because we will cultivate what we celebrate. And when we are forced to celebrate the death of, of, of the, like I say, the only innocent people, the, the only people yeah. who have never actually committed a sin. Oh, all right. I'm done. Done with my rant. <laughs> so you've written a book, Wimpy, Weak, and Woke. Give us a little rundown about it. Um, I, it's new, came out, what? It came out this fall, yeah. this past fall, right? Um, tell us, where's your heart in all of that, in writing this book, and what do you want people to get from it? My heart in writing the book was to explain to people a couple of things. Number one, uh, to, to, to do the very best I could, to explaining the philosophies behind what's happening now. Every parent mm -hmm. knows what it's like to have their kids come home from school or come home from a friend's house or watch something on TV or YouTube because no matter how mm -hmm. much you try to control what they see, the enemy – and by the enemy, I mean the devil. The devil, his demons, all they find a way in. They find a way to get an ad or something to your kids to confuse them. And they're doing this because they really believe. Well, I'll, I'll get back to that. Your kids come to you and say, what does this mean? Every parent knows what I'm talking about. You see it on the news and you go, what in God's name is happening? <laughs> what in the world yeah. does it even mean? that a, 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 a boy can play on a girl's sports team. What do they mean by that's their truth? What do they mean by calling a person they or them, you know, like using they, them pronouns, or th they don't understand what's going on. And so I wanted in my book to trace this back. Where is this coming from? Because I want Christians to be warned. We're on the edge of the end, the absolute full destruction of Western civilization. And what I would like Christians to understand is that the war against Western civilization is in fact actually a war against Christianity. It, it, it is a war against America, sure. But really that's because the foundations of America and Western civilization are built on Judeo-Christian ethics. It's built on a Christian worldview. That's not to say that America and Christianity are synonymous. They're not. We're not saying that America is a Christian nation or something like that. So um, some people freak out about Christian nationalism. But there is intellectually no way to, to disagree that Western civilization was founded on a Christian worldview that there is a God. He created a world with absolutes. That means there are things that are absolutely true. We may not know all those things. We're still discovering those things. But two plus two equals four, and it's always going to equal four. That's just the way it is, right? Yep. All of that is being destroyed by people who actually hate God. They hate Christianity. They hate the, the concept of absolute truth. They do not believe that two plus two equals four. They believe that's too rigid. They do not believe that there are only two genders, that God created man and woman, and you can't actually change. It's not interchangeable. They don't believe that. They don't believe that physical reality is necessarily absolute which is why they believe you can change your gender because they say, well, they say that reality is found within. It's, it's the way I feel. It's, it's my truth because they're very postmodern now. So I wanted to write a book to explain to people, this is a lie. It is going to wreck the world. It is infiltrating mm -hmm. Christianity. And a lot of the big Eva types, as I said earlier, they're trying to find a way to synthesize Christianity with this new postmodern worldview. It's a Marxist worldview as well. I think Jordan Peterson, I, I believe Jordan Peterson calls it meta-Marxism, which I thought was a brilliant way to say it. I think that comes from Jordan Peterson. Um, but in other words, Marxism is the way they see the entire world. 
You know, so it's the way that we see. We see the entire world. If you're a Christian, you see the entire world, everything in it. You see it through a, through a worldview that God is real and through the Bible. So any question you ask me about what, what something means, I would base my answer on the Bible. Metamarxism means you base everything you see on a, 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 an idea that there is nothing more than power, oppressed and oppressors. So everything mm. is about that, right? So this Big Eva is trying to synthesize Christianity and this postmodern metamarxism, if you will. And that is why they write op-eds in the New York Times bashing traditional Christians like you and me. It's the reason they start things like the Ann campaign. It's the reason that they want to say, well, yeah, no, we are pro-life, but we're also pro-justice, which means we have to take money from some people and give it to other people so that they stop having abortions, you know. Um, and I want people to understand these two things cannot coexist. Marxism and Christianity cannot coexist. Yeah. Um, postmodernism and Christianity cannot coexist. And so um, the last thing I'll say about it is that I I get so much pushback from my podcast. I, I included... 650 footnotes in this book. <laughs> there there wow. are literally oh, almost 100 pages of footnotes at the end citing my sources so that people understand the original words from Karl Marx, Freud, from the neo-Marxist, Nietzsche, all these people that we say, well, this is what they believed. And then you start seeing the Christian left saying, no, it's not. That's propaganda. You don't even know what critical race theory is. Well, I, I quote the original critical th uh, race theorist. It's their own words. You can read it for yourself and, and judge it. So if you're looking for something that explains it, I think simply, and that you know has the original sourcing on it, I think that you should uh, check out my book. No, I think that's great. And everybody should snag it. You have another book too that came before that one. I'm sorry. I didn't have it written in my note. Actually, no, I do have it written. Awake notes, and think. Alive to Truth. Awake and Alive to Truth. <laughs> yeah. I've got it right here in my notes. I apologize. No, don't worry about it. Um, so you've got two books out. Grab both of those. Um, you touched on school very briefly here. What are your thoughts on public school? Oh, gosh. I mean, I'm a very big believer in homeschooling. Um, and I know that not everybody can afford to do that. Uh, here's what I would say. There is nothing more important, I believe, nothing more important for Christians to do than to train your kids in a Christian biblical worldview. It is, it's astounding. Cr religious people in this country are the only people really having children. People outside of, of, of Christianity and Catholicism and even Judaism um, just aren't really having that many kids, all right? We are having the children. However, we are not educating the children, and they get confused in school. They get indoctrinated into Marxism, into communism, into secular atheism. Um, I would call it humanism, secular humanism. They go to college, and they go full atheist, or they fully deconstruct. And I guess what I want to say to Christians is this, and Catholics, we are providing the children of the future who are tearing down our faith. <laughs> We're the only one providing. We're providing the material, if you will. I'm, t I'm, I'm calling humans material, which is actually a wrong way to say it. But we're providing the resources, the human resources, that make it possible to destroy Western civilization, tear down Christianity, promote atheism, it's absolutely crazy. Why is that happening? Because we're not training our children in a Christian worldview. We're sending them to public schools so that they can get indoctrinated. Here's the thing I'm scared about. I say this all the time. I say this to friends of mine who are Christians, who love the Lord, who even vote for conservative people, who are against abortion. And when I say what I just said, they go, oh, my gosh, John, you've, you're just so extreme. You're just mm. so radical. They just don't believe me. And I don't know why they don't know what their kids are learning at school. And I don't know what else to do. So I, I, I pull my hair out like, what else can I do? Which is also why I have so much source material in my book. And I've told a few friends, please read my book. See what your kids are learning in school. I've got the source material there if you don't believe me. Better yet, just look at your kids' material. The problem is, is that Christians are so naive 
and we're so daft when it comes to worldview that we just don't believe it's possible. We don't believe it's possible for schools to teach our kids their 82 genders. That would never really happen. That's what they say. So more and more Christians are waking up. I would say this. If you say, well, I just don't really have the money. Um, I'm trying to live in a good neighborhood, blah, blah, blah. I'd say sell your house. Move to a worse neighborhood. Do whatever you need to do to homeschool your kids or get them in a in some sort of Christian classical learning, something Anything but public school. Last warning, a lot of these Christian private schools are now going woke as well. Um, And I know this because I work with two Christian private schools here in the city that I live in. The material is coming in for Big Eva. They are trying to revolutionize Christianity from within. So they want to make it woke. They want to make it socialist. They want to make it liberal and progressive, but they're doing it from within by changing this material and then calling it, quote, biblical justice or diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it is just as progressive and radical as the public school curriculum. So if you do a private school or a Christian school or something, you need to find out what they are learning. There is nothing more important than training your kid to sniff out this Marxist junk everywhere that you see it. Yeah, and that's something so important. Parents have to stay vigilant, regardless of what you're doing. I mean, even if you're homeschooling, you should be probably reading the material prior to your children reading the material. If you're certainly going to a school, you should be paying attention to what's going on in the classrooms. We went to, it wasn't a Christian school. We were at a charter school that was supposed to have conservative values. Uh, It was a Hillsdale member school. And my son brings home a book, and it's talking about oral sex and orgies and all these things. And I'm like, no, 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 I don't want my son to read this. I don't know why this is in the curriculum. I start alerting parents and then I get gaslit because I'm alerting parents to the fact that this is in the book. And then I'm told that um, if we remove the book, how far do we go like with book banning? Is And this is supposed to be a conservative aligned school. Um, how, how far do we go? Like, do we not teach children about the Holocaust? Do we not teach children about all of these other atrocious things in history? And I'm like, I'm sorry. There is a very big difference between learning about a historical, very unfortunate account of the Holocaust and talking to kids about orgies, two totally very different things. And the teacher told me, uh, and I took it all the way up to the principal and they gave me a lot of pushback too, but they told me that he could have an extension on the assignment. I said, no, no, I don't think you understand. He's not doing this assignment. He's not going to read this book. Um, and so she was like, well, how about he just reads this part? And I said, no, then the book is still in his hands. Like, what do you not get? So wow. even in these Christian schools or a conservative aligned schools, because there are some classical schools that are not necessarily Christian, they're charter schools. There's a lot of this stuff going on and it's happening. It is quite literally everywhere and getting, honestly, I, we had the hardest time getting Christian conservatives to kind of wake up and actually put in the effort to care about their children. A lot of them involved in politics. And I'm thinking, what is it worth to go save your city or, you know, work on a campaign, but you sacrifice your own children right in front of you? Um, I'm sure that's a lot of what you are passionate about. I know you said you were passionate about it. Um, There's a podcast. I forget whose podcast you're on. The guy with the long beard. Um, You're on a podcast and you guys were talking about school. Yes. And I was like, yes. Like I am so in line with everything that you're saying. You can't send your kids off to these people without expecting them to be the number one influence in their life because they spend the most waking hours with their teachers. Yep. I'm going to be mad all day long for you telling me that that was a Hillsdale related school because I really, really like Hillsdale. Now I'm, now I'm just ticked well, listen, off. I went to Hillsdale. I will nice. tell you since, because I told you that I flew to Hillsdale. Um, the school ended up losing their Hillsdale membership. Oh, uh, the, the board ended up firing the board. It was hard to wake them up, but that's a longer story. Maybe I'll do a whole well, podcast that, episode on that. Okay. Now I'm a little bit less mad. Good job for Hillsdale. Yeah. <laughs> Good job for you. The problem is, is that I just think that we're, I mean, I gotta be honest. 10 years ago, I would have heard you say that. I would have been like, you're crazy. That's not happening. Yeah. That's just not happening. I wouldn't have believed it. So I, I understand where people are coming from, but but we've we've got to. If you're somebody listening and you're thinking this sounds crazy, I'm telling you, I feel you. I would have thought it was crazy ten years ago, because we just don't have a robust Christian theology of evil. 
and how much the mm -hmm. devil hates you. He, he is consumed with hatred for you because you bear the image of the person he hates the most. He wants to steal. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy. That's what the Bible says. He's looking for every way he could possibly do it. I just think that Christians, we've just taken it for granted that the world is not that evil because we were raised in a, in a country that used to honor God and we, we no longer honor God. We're seeing, we're in the, I believe we're in the judgment of God right now and it can get a lot worse, but we're already in the judgment of God. Part of the judgment of God is that we become delusional. That's what the Bible mm -hmm. says, because they rejected the truth. God sent them a strong delusion. That's what the Bible says. You, they rejected the truth. And so part of that judgment is that you become delusional and you end up thinking that evil things are good and good things are evil. And you end up not even knowing what the truth is. So we need to pray for that the church would wake up. Man, now I'm yeah. fired up. Anyway, great job with you going. More <laughs> parents need to do it. It, it can be tough because you're going to get pushed back. And even with our school, I got uh, completely gaslit, was told that I was a leftist trying to take down the school, which is just completely laughable. Um, <laughs> but uh, parents have to advocate for their children. I mean, they just have to. You're like if, the worst leftist in the whole world. Right, right. If you don't have, if you don't advocate for your children, who's going to? Well, here's, yeah, right? and, and, and uh, you know what, amen. And you know what is amazing is that this is what we got to understand. The people who are arguing that we, they need to learn about this stuff, just like they learn about the Holocaust, they think they are advocating for your kids. They think they're doing something good. Yeah. So they're advocating for your kids in the wrong way. They are literally the devil's advocate. <laughs> they're literally being yeah. the advocate of the devil to teach your kids evil stuff. Why? Because they believe it's good. And I write about that in my book. These people think that Christian ethics is are bad. It's the reason uh, there's a guy, and oh, you know, Lord God, I wish I hadn't read it. I, last year was a very tough year for me. I, 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 I was not depressed. I don't struggle with depression or anything. But I got to be honest, it was, it was a dark period, my, my darkest period I've had in 20 years because mm. I had to read this disgusting crap. And I read this guy called Wilhelm Reich, Reich, Reich. Uh, he is the author of a book called The Sexual Revolution that came out in 1935. It is the book that, that uh, lit the 1960s sexual revolution. That's what we all call the sexual revolution or sexual liberation or the free love movement of the, of the hippies. He's, he's their, like, hero, right? He was a, Freud, mm -hmm. uh, a Freudo-Marxist, he called himself. In other words, he was a he was Freudian and he was a Marxist. And he wrote a book called The Sexual Revolution that is the most god-awful thing I've ever read. And basically what he's saying is this. The reason that people suffer is because, and, and I'm sorry, we got to go a little bit R-rated here. And I'm, I'm not going to do it in a crazy way, but it's a little R-rated. The reason people suffer is because they don't have access to what he would call good orgasms. If you're not having good orgasms, it causes you to commit murder. It causes you to steal. It causes you to um, uh, envy, meaning you want to take what someone else has and blah, blah, blah. And so in other words, he's applying sexual liberation to Marx's revolution of the proletariat, against, so the poor against the rich or against the business owners. He's applying it to that. We need a revolution against Christian morality that says that people should not be having sex outside of marriage or before marriage. And if we do that, then humanity is going to evolve into a new perfected state. And so he argued for the sexual liberation of children, of babies, yeah. of toddlers. He argued that children should be able to... Uh, fondle each other and have sex with each other children should be, should be able to watch their parents have sex it's the most disgusting so and this is the hero of the 1960s yeah. liberation movements we are now in the midst of that these crazy people think by teaching your children about all of these sexual practices in fourth grade and gender by the way all the gender stuff they think that they are advocating for your kids to lead them to a better life. Who are they, who are they liberating your kids from? You. 
the parents who say, no, I don't want my kid watching pornography. No, I don't want my four-year-old engaging in sexual activity. Your kid needs to be liberated from you. You are actually oppressing them. These people are demented. The Bible says they rejected the truth, so I sent them a strong delusion. That's what's happening now. You kind of just led into my next question. I wanted to ask you what you think about uh, comprehensive sex education at school. And what a lot of what you're talking about sounds a lot like Alfred Kinsey, too. Just some of the most repulsive, disgusting things that I could possibly ever think about. But that's how it's trickling into the schools with comprehensive sex education. And what we're seeing a lot of times is that comprehensive sex education, there's studies that say it actually increases sexual activity. It actually increases STDs. It increases teen pregnancy. And then we have this completely sexualized youth who think that it's normal to have sex, who think it's normal to go sleep around or have, you know, bodies is what they call it. How many bodies do you have? What's your body count? Blah, blah, blah. You know, that's the lingo these days. And the normalization of that ends up affecting, you know, the pro-life movement, essentially. It's like, no, 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 no. Children should not be sexually active. We do not need that. They need to, we need to protect their innocence as much as we possibly can. But comprehensive sex ed, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I'm with you. It's 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 disgusting and it's ridiculous. It doesn't work, meaning it doesn't make people go, oh, okay, I'm not going to engage engage in sex. No, they actually promote that you're supposed to be engaging in sex. Why? Yeah. Because they believe that if you're not having sex, there's something wrong with you. So having sex is actually going to liberate you. You're going to be better mentally. You're going to get smarter. You're going to have more better mental health. You're going to be happier. Blah 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 blah. It's so absolutely evil. So it doesn't actually work. Now, even if it did work, we would still be saying you shouldn't be doing that. It's immoral. But it's not a surprise that it doesn't work. One of the main things I talk about in my book that I think is maybe the most important point of my whole book. And again, people got to put their philosophical hat on for a second if you don't mind. But here's the reason why. I think because we've not taught Christian theology very well, a lot of Christians think that God that God gives us commands and, and and yeah, I know I'm supposed to do those things or don't do those things because God said so. And so if I want to be like Jesus, I need to obey him, but they don't understand that when you obey God, things actually work better for you in the world he created. So in other words, they kind of think, well, life would be better if I disobeyed God, but I know I shouldn't. So I'm going to do the thing that makes my life worse because it makes God happy. That is not true. That is actually the inverse of the truth. God created a moral universe. That means the universe is built in such a way as to glorify God's own character, like who he is. It would be bizarre if God created a universe (laughs) <laughs> that is offensive to his own character. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So he created a universe to work in a certain way. Then God gave us a moral law also based on his own character, the Ten Commandments. It's This is how we get to know who God is. We know that God hates murder. Why? Because he tells us not to murder. And then he even gives us a penalty yeah. of, of, of death, eye for an eye. So we know he hates it supremely, right? So God's moral law the Ten Commandments, who he is, his commands, coincides with the world he created. So it is not a surprise that when you are not promoting sexual activity to children, for God's sake, some of the stuff I had to read to write about Kinsey, they're teaching four, fifth, sixth, seventh graders how to have, quote, safe anal sex. These people are sick. Uh, and the reason, well, we'll get into that. It's not a surprise that this is not leading to good outcomes because yeah. they're not supposed to be doing that. And so the whole thing is just messed up. And people also have to understand the reason that they're teaching some of it. Now, by the way, I don't think they should be teaching any of this stuff. I think they should be teaching how reproduction works as a biological function. You know what I mean? Because it's it's bio- biology. Um, a, a man and a woman come together to reproduce, sperm, egg. That's just part of science that people need need to learn. The reason that they teach these other things is under the banner of diversity, equity, and inclusion because 
Well, what happens if you're a fourth grader who is queer um, or, or you're, you're gay and you're like, well, you're making that you're not being inclusive to gay people because they're never going to have sex that leads to procreation because they're gay. So what you're telling them is that who you are is actually not as good as who heterosexual people are. And what you're telling them is that your kind of sex that you want to have is not normal. Heterosexual sex is the normal kind. And so in sociology, they call that heteronormativity. And they say, well, we got to we got to fight against heteronormativity, which means if we are teaching heterosexual sex, meaning sex that, that leads to procreation, well, if we're teaching that, then we can't be biased and prejudiced against gay people, so then we have to teach mm-hmm. oral and anal sex. All of that is included, and the minute that I say something negative about diversity, equity, inclusion, tons of my Christian friends go, oh my gosh, you're such a MAGA guy. Christians have mm. got to wake up and understand what's happening. So that's a really long explanation. No, that needs to be taught at home. It's no surprise that it's having yeah. terrible outcomes. And this also leads to what I kind of said earlier, which you would know a lot more about than I do. But one of my good friends at my church is the one who runs the pregnancy clinic in town. And I've asked her so many times, is it actually the case that the reason people want to have abortions is because they don't understand how they ended up pregnant because they don't understand how sex works over and over and over again. She's like, no, that's not. And, 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 and And even the majority of people having abortions are in the age range of 20 to 30, not from 12 to 20. You know what I mean? So, and like I said, in 2021, the majority of women who had abortions already gave birth to a living child. So the whole thing is propaganda and it's a lie. Yeah, it's unfortunate. And there is absolute truth, like you were talking about, relating to all of this stuff, relating to who we are. You you talk about DEI. We talked about comprehensive sex ed. We talk about babies living. uh, All of these things have an absolute truth. And it is in the Bible. People can go find it. But for the time being, they can go find your book. Where can they find Wimpy Week and Woke? Yes, it looks. I'm going to show people what it looks like. You probably can see it next to me, but I'll give you a close up. Look how beautiful this book cover is. <laughs> yeah, that that awesome. book cover has triggered a lot of people, and I didn't think it would. <laughs> I was like, what's wrong with you people? Anyway, because they're wimpy. Weak I and don't woke. know. I'm like, um, <laughs> if you're getting this upset by the title, you just might right. be a little. All right. Anyway, uh, go get the book at Amazon. Um, you can get the Kindle version on Amazon as well. You can go to my website, johnlcooper.com, get the book. And, and, and if I could just give one last plug. Please. The book is good for people. Like, let's just say somebody listening is hearing what we're saying and they're going, hey, I'm on your page. I, I, I'm, I'm pro-life. I, I, this, I'm a Christian. But I'm on your page. But I do think you're exaggerating a little bit about the threat. This whole, like, Western civilization getting destroyed. If you're exaggerating a little bit, honestly, you just, you need to take a look at this book. Or if you're listening and you say, honestly, I've got a lot of Christian friends who love God. They're such great people, but they, 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 they don't want to get involved in this stuff because they keep calling it quote culture war. I don't want to get involved in the culture war. I don't want to be extreme. I don't want to be a MAGA guy, whatever they're saying to you. This might be a book that you get for them. And you just say, hey, can we read it together? And if you disagree, I'd like to know why. But we could read it together and talk about it. Um, I've already talked to a couple of people who I know who have said, I had no idea it was this bad. I was wrong. And to me, that's, that's all that I'm going for in the book. Yeah. If anybody today thinks that we couldn't be getting there, thinks that you're over-exaggerating, like they shut the whole country down. Hello. I mean, we would have thought nothing like that would happen, but there's these things that are like really in your face. I mean, there's litter boxes in schools now. Good God. We're there. We're there. It's there's no, <laughs> this isn't happening. I'm serious. That's the best like how unsanitary and disgusting, but we are there. So people need to read your book. And I love that you put the citations in the back and you tell people where to look it up because if they don't believe you, then they can. And that opens the door for them to do their own research, to be educated on it themselves and look into all of that. Because I think that people, a lot of times will wait for some influencer or somebody else to tell them what's happening and what you do in the book, which is phenomenal, 
and I'm not calling you an influencer necessarily, um, although you do have a lot of influence, but I think it's up to mom and dad to go look at these resources, to go look at where you're finding everything and to go do their own research. Like how can you parent, how can you do all of these things without doing your own research? You have to care enough to do that. John, I end the episode with ev uh, one question um, that I ask every single guest. The name of the show is Speak Out. And so we ask if you can encourage everybody to speak out on something that they feel uncomfortable with, maybe it's some of the things that they're gonna find in your book, what one piece of advice would you give them to speak out boldly? Mm. I, I would probably encourage people, you know, the, there's these words of Jesus. I don't want to say I didn't used to understand them, but, but I didn't think they were necessarily applicable to me, which is, mm. do you remember when Jesus told his disciples, he said, hey, don't be surprised when people hate you. They hated yeah. me first. They're going to hate you because you belong to me. You're preaching my words, so you do know they're going to hate you. I used to kind of think uh, that, that that wasn't really applicable in America. I, I didn't really – uh, look, I had people make fun of me, but making fun of you is not like hating you. You know what I mean? Like yeah. getting made fun of for Jesus. I'm not being beaten for my faith or something. I'm not dying for Jesus here. You're just getting somebody going, oh, you're such a dork. I can't believe you follow Jesus. Oh, you're such a – you know, when I was growing up, they used the word goody, goody, such a goody, goody. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah. John won't drink, you know, whatever it may be. You get made fun of, but you're not really hated for Jesus. Okay. Maybe there was a couple of people that said, I don't really want you working here because you're too loud, but it wasn't vicious. That has changed. And I think that what happened with that change is because of more, it's because of moral issues. The world's not going to hate you. If you just say, Hey, I love Jesus. Well, well, they don't have a problem with that. Taylor Swift says she loves Jesus, and the world praises her for it. Um, but at the same time, you know, Taylor Swift says, well, what it means to love Jesus is to vote for a woman to have choice to abort her own child. So she's got a real sort of confused understanding of what it means to love Jesus. She's created a new version of Jesus. And if you say you love that Jesus, the world's not going to hate you for that. In fact, they would say, ooh, yeah, good job. I love that you love Jesus. That's so great. Because Jesus was a nice person. He wanted us to yeah. have the right to, to end the life of our unborn child, right? So what it is, is it's on the moral issues. If you want to stand up for Jesus in your generation, you got to get prepared for people to not like you very much. <laughs> you mm -hmm. can say it. The, you can be the most polite person in the world. You can be the most loving person in the world, the most caring person in the world, and you are going to be called a bigot. You are going to be called someone who is unloving, and you're going to be like, but I don't understand because I am loving. you got to understand the world has switched the definition of what being loving means. To them, being loving means fighting for a woman's right to abort her baby. And to you, loving means loving that woman and saying, you don't want to live with the regret of killing a human being. It's your own child. And being loving means to tell them that, that, uh, that your child, ought, in other words, you're loving the child by saying, I'm standing up for your child, whether you know it or not. I'm standing up for that child because if that child was alive, I would be fighting for her. I'd be fighting for him. And so I'm fighting for him now out of love. So the, the world's redefined it. You, you got to understand that to live for Jesus now means to speak sanity, speak clarity, speak truth, yeah. and you're going to be hated for it. But you'll be able to go to bed at the end of every night saying, you know what? I'm not looking for the applause from the world. I just want to hear those two wonderful wor words. Well done, yeah. good and faithful servant. Actually, that's like five words, but you get my point. I was thinking of well done. Uh, I want to hear those words. Well done. That's what I'm looking for. I don't want to be a man pleaser. I want to be a God pleaser. Yeah. Amen. John, thank you for joining. I hope that everybody goes out and grabs your book. Um, it's a phenomenal book. And I think that a lot of people are going to find what they're looking for when they're saying like, what is happening in the world today? How do I, how do I address this with my friends? And then the, your idea of giving the book to somebody else and saying, Hey, let's read this together, especially if they might not have the words. Sometimes it is hard to talk about this stuff. It can be uncomfortable and you do get pushed back. So easing in and maybe having this book as kind of a little,
little bit of a buffer would be phenomenal. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Go follow John on social media. I think your handle is John, is it John L. Cooper or John John Cooper? L. Cooper. Yeah, go follow John on social media. Uh, it's been a pleasure. You too. Thank you so much.